Well, that's one of the hardest things I find uh, players coming back from an injury is actually rebuilding their confidence. Mm -hmm. And any performance, like my whole philosophy is that I want to make players confident. And that, that, that is straight from the start. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one resource for all things fitness and performance in Switzerland. Today, I'm lucky to chat with Patrick Searson, ex-rugby player turned personal trainer and strength coach. Patrick is based in Australia and now coaches hundreds of rugby players online. Patrick, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, that's no, a pleasure. So how, let's get let's started from the beginning. How did you start rugby? Uh, I started rugby when I was, how old was I? I was 10 years old. So I switched over from soccer because I kept tackling everyone. So dad got me <laughs> straight to playing rugby. Um, I have two older brothers. So my two older brothers uh, were always pretty rough with me. So being the younger, smaller brother, I always want to try to prove my dominance. And that sort of got me into playing rugby. So I've actually been playing rugby ever since. I still play now. Oh, nice. Uh, where, where in Australia are you based? In Sydney. Sydney. And how, how big, I guess... Uh, for those who don't know, rugby is is one of the national sports down in in Australia. So, can you talk a little bit about you know in in Sydney how many how many clubs is there? How many different levels is there? Can you talk about all this? Uh, yeah. So Sydney specifically. Okay. So the top of the top, you have your Super Rugby. Mm-hmm. Okay, which is your Waratahs, which is New South Wales, the Reds. Um, what do you got? ACT. You got uh, Melbourne. Melbourne have a team. Um, Western Force are sort of in and out. I don't know what's going on there. And then you have, and they verse the New Zealand teams, mm-hmm. um, and then the uh, South African team, Argentina team. I'm not okay. sure what's happening with Super Rugby next year. Who knows? Um, then under that, you have the Shoot Shield level, and that's the level I play. Um, there was a bit of an NRC comp, which was an in between that, but yeah. I'm not sure what's going on with that at the moment. Yeah. But at the moment, there's still club rugby, which is so first level is Shoot Shield. And that ha- would have four divisions. Yeah. Um, and then you would have, after that, you would have your, your Div 1 subbies all the way through to Div 5 subbies. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a few hundred teams just around Sydney. Easily. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty huge. And, and there's a huge depth to the field as well, right, compared to other countries. Like if you look here in Switzerland, it's a small country and rugby is still a developing sport. But we, we only have a handful of leagues and, and there isn't much depth to to the to the teams and and you know even just number of guys so how how was it growing up in that environment where really rugby is part of the culture and kind of everybody knows rugby everybody watches rugby how, can you talk about that that culture a little bit yeah so rugby in australia it's it, it was probably a lot bigger back in when i was growing up in the early 2000s mm-hmm. obviously we had the rugby world cup yeah. 2003 and around that time was when I was sort of got start, just starting going into high school. Mm. And in high schools over here, it's actually quite big. So uh, the biggest school systems, uh, it's, it's very competitive. Uh, they'll, they'll bring in players. It's, yeah, it's actually, it's actually quite competitive over here. That, But it, it's, it's always good because people know, uh, know and talk about rugby over here. Um, it's sort of been dying off the last few years, and that was part of the reason why I, I wanted to start something to help out more rugby players. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the other codes, like uh, Rugby League, have been getting quite big over here. Yeah. Uh, same as AFL. Um, yeah. I'm not sure you know what AFL is, but yeah, that's getting quite big as well. And what's it? Soccer is sort of getting a little bit of a foothold, but it's, it's sort of played in a different time of the year now um, compared to rugby. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you got the Bleslow that's coming up just this weekend, and I think that will be quite large. And I think uh, that needs to be a big thing. Australia needs to be start competing in that again, mm-hmm. <laughs> which we haven't for ne- nearly twenty years now. <laughs> um, we need to start competing in that. So I think it needs to grow uh, in Australia again a bit more. Do you, how do you explain that? You know, union was really popular before, and now it's fading out, and and league is kind of taking over. How how's that dynamic? Because it's interesting from from over here, we we don't even have a league league here in Switzerland. I know in England it's it's fairly popular, and there's a few other countries as well that 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 have uh, you know a substantial number of players in the the league um, kind of rules. But how, how do you explain that you know dynamic between the two? The different the differences. Yeah, I mean, so... I, I'm more how 
you know, culturally, why was one popular and that now why is the other one a little bit more popular? Um, I honestly, I just think it has to do with advertising, like, as okay. in why, why rugby league is becoming more popular. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I think rugby league is becoming more popular. Just and it's mainly around Sydney um, and mm. Brisbane, okay. those two two states. And I think it's been their advertising and then getting to their younger kids a bit earlier and mm -hmm. doing it better than what rugby union has. Mm -hmm. And I and it's just more accessible, right? Okay. It, it's much cheaper to go and watch a top level rugby league team yeah. than it is to go and watch a top level rugby union. So to go to watch Waratahs, it would be, you know, maybe a couple of hundred dollars for a family to go. Yeah. Whereas to go and watch a rugby league team, it might be thirty dollars to go. Mm -hmm. You know, so like you're seeing the best of the best for yeah. a much cheaper price. Um, and I also, there's one sort of place in Australia where you'd go and watch that, um, or, you know, a Waratah game, which would be in Sydney, mm -hmm. in the heart of the city, mm -hmm. compared to a rugby league match, which is a bit more spread out over the city or, um, you know, Newcastle have a side and just, just along the coastline, there's more, there's more teams. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that has made a big difference. Yeah, so that's interesting. Can you so maybe yeah for for those who are not aware of the the different uh, types of rugby that there are, uh, and and maybe specifically with the the, the larger squads, and we'll, we can leave sevens on the side. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between union and league? Um, as in like the, at the actual sport or the, the actual, yeah the yeah sport? the actual yep. the actual sport on the on the field. How is it different one from the oh, other? Cause, okay, so cause most people yep. here would be more familiar with the union side of things. Uh, so first things first is you, you only get six tackles in rugby league. Mm -hmm. So you have six tackles and you have to make a play or you'll lose the ball. So usually they'll, they'll kick, mm -hmm. right? So uh, field position is still really big, but you get six tackles and it's done. Um, every time you get tackled, they have the ruck, all right? And they get, if it's a dominant tackle, they can lie on them for a bit uh, longer. Mm -hmm. There's no fighting for the ball. They mm -hmm. have to get up and play the ball between their legs. Mm -hmm. And to be onside, it's not just last man's feet. It's mm -hmm. 10 meters back. Okay. Right? So you have 10 meters back. So it's a different style of fitness. And it's a different style of player too. Because for that, uh, you have to run a bit more meters. You have to be running backwards a whole lot more. Yeah. Um, the contacts can be a bit bigger. Right. Uh, because, because of that 10 meter gap, mm -hmm. you have that, that bit more time to... Uh, <laughs> gain gain a bit more speed so <laughs> it, it's it's a totally different game um even though it, they're quite similar it, it is really a, a very different game yeah have, have you have you had the chance to play that side as well yeah so i played that in school okay. um which is yeah, it was good fun it's just different yeah um i didn't like it as much because uh, the position i play in rugby union yeah um doesn't doesn't transfer over as well but yeah it's still good fun to play like a I have nothing wrong with it. What what position do you play? I am a seven in uh, rugby union, and I am I, I played centres in rugby league. Okay, so I found it really boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's not quite the not quite the same game. I can imagine that. So, can you talk a little about about your career? You know, as a player, what were some of your defining moments uh, coming up as a rugby player? As a player, so my 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 thing was. I always just wanted to get as high as I could. I'm, I'm not a big guy. I've never been a, uh, a big guy. Like I'm 176 centimeters tall. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I get to about 86 kilos lean max. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, otherwise, to, when I push up to about 90, 90, 92, you know, I'm, I'm starting to put on a fair bit of fat to get there. Right. Um, and I just don't like how I feel when I get, I get there. I don't usually play as well. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, for me to make first grade at that weight uh, in that shoot shield competition was quite a big deal because I was mm -hmm. still like a, a small guy. Well, I had to be I had to be a lot stronger uh, than most people. Yeah. Um, I, I first made first grade when I was twenty one, okay. and that was that was pretty young, and I, you know I could have still pushed for some higher honors there. But I did my MCL and my PCL in a uh, in oh. a clean out i got cleaned out from the side right and then that that took me that took that was near the start of the season it took me the whole season to pretty much come back mm -hmm. and i just totally shot my confidence for pilfering the ball which was like my thing 
Okay. Um, being a pest. So. Right. <laughs> Did you, yeah, you, so then, have you been able to, to get that back that, you know, that, yeah, that confidence yeah, yeah. In, in your game? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was probably one of the hardest things. I, I uh, went away, I came back. Um, how do you, how do you think I had like six months off? Um, okay. after that and I came back came back stronger put a whole lot of work in came back and uh, remade a first grade team and we actually had quite a good side so that was we didn't win the comp but you know for the team I play in which hasn't been a notoriously a strong team for the last mm-hmm. 20 odd years and I've got a, there's a few reasons behind that but um, it's, a, it's the club I was I grew up with so it's a club I want to help grow yeah. Um, and we actually had quite a good team when I was playing first grade then. So, what, so one of the things you do um, is in your coaching with, with the other rugby players that you work with is, is injury prevention, obviously as a, as a strength and conditioning coach. So can you talk a little bit about that, more the recovery, like the mental side of a recovery from an injury? I think it's, it's a very important part and we don't talk about it as much as the actual rehab process, you know, physical rehab process. So can you dive a little bit into that? Maybe talking about your experience first, uh, coming back from that nasty injury, how you get, got over that fear of, you know, getting back on the pitch and, and playing full strength again, and how you now help uh, your players, your athletes to, to gain that confidence back even after a, a bad injury sometimes. Yeah, definitely. That's, um, that's, that's one of the hardest things I find uh, players coming back from an injury is actually rebuilding their confidence. Mm-hmm. And any performance, like my whole philosophy is that I want to make players confident. And that, that, that is straight from the start. So yes, right. I want you to make them strong, but what is the end goal is I really want to make them confident in their own ability. Because when people are confident, even if they haven't done strength training or they haven't done any prep, they just come in with that confidence, they play well. And so that's my whole thing. And when you get an injury and it just wipes away that confidence, mm-hmm. it, it is a, it's a really hard thing to come back from. Like it's a painful, it's a soul searching um, place. So one of the first things I usually, uh, when, I, when we're talking to some of my players that have, have an injury, is I usually ask them, to go into the pain. Don't try and run from it. Don't try and hide from it. Just go and see what it means to them. You know, just sit with it. Just sit with, you know, those feelings that come up around that injury. I remember when I did that and it came up a lot of self-worth issues, you know, a lot of things that like, because I have this injury, or maybe I'm not good enough for mm-hmm. X, Y, and Z in my life, you know? Mm-hmm. All these different aspects came up. So just, just, sitting, just sitting with the pain just sitting with that, 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 that in your back of your mind uh, is very, uh, it, can show, it can show you a lot about yourself. Mm-hmm. So that's usually my step number one is just, you know, see what comes up around it. And then step number two is we're going to start building confidence. So start building confidence. We're going to start getting you stronger. We're going to start working out little weak links. You know, we, let's have a look at how that injury happened mm-hmm. and let's see if we could, uh, either make it a safer environment and trying to train that position. So maybe they didn't have the mobility in a certain position. Like I remember when I did my MCL, my adductors were seriously tight, right? So I could hardly get into a side split. I'm still working at it, but my adductors were really tight Mm -hmm. and I had no mobility there. So when I got hit from the side, my leg went out to the side, uh, my right leg, and I just had nowhere to go. Right. right? If, If it had a bit more mobility, through my, my hip, uh, through the, my adductors, and it could have slid out a bit more, it, it, it probably would have been fine. Mm-hmm. But because it didn't, it sort of got to its end range, then my knee collapsed under it. Okay. Right? And then my, because my knee collapsed, my, my MCL went, P, uh, and then my knee hit the ground, PCL went too. Right. Um, so looking at that, looking at the footage, and being like, okay, if I get here strong, and you know, I work on that mobility, then I can come back a stronger player, all right? And mm. I shouldn't have to worry so much about that happening again. Mm. And I have been put in those positions of late uh, where that sort of similar situation has happened and, you know, I haven't done it again. I've actually, my, my extra mobility and strength in my, and length has really helped me. It has really helped stop that. All right, so number two is obviously getting stronger. 
Mm-hmm. And then number three is then getting back on the field and in the training and practice and just practicing how that, that position. So like I was in the jackal, it was just me getting back over the ball and getting, getting, getting myself hit. I just had to be in there and I had to get it done mm-hmm. right, in practice. And the more I did it, the more my confidence came back. And I'm not one for using pads. I want people to come and actually hit me when I do that. I'm like, yep, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Let's, let's just go. Like, <laughs> otherwise, I'm going to be fart assing around about it, and I don't want to do that. Um, so that was, that was my comeback uh, personally, was just to get in there and actually just do it. Do that same thing that happened to me in the game and just practice, practice, practice. And then by the time I got back out in the field, it was like it hadn't happened. Yeah, I think it's um, it's such an important point that you bring up to put yourself in the position where you get injured. You know, you you got you got injured. You know, trying to to uh, trying to jackal a ball, but for someone getting injured during a tackle or you know doing a tackle, um, it's so important to get back into that movement uh, and maybe not you know from day one full speed again, but you know start back on your knees, get yeah. get someone to walk into you, and and then just kind of build it back up like you said to build that you know that mental strength as well that confidence to to be back in those positions and not fear because the worst thing you can do is get back on the field of play and be ready physically but then mentally still not quite being there and still being afraid of putting yourself in that position or you know like being afraid of sprinting if you had an, a hamstring injury it's gonna it's gonna hamper your whole game no 100 like that's and, and just this year i've had a problem with my ac i took a big hit on my right AC mm-hmm. and it's, it, it uh, had a grade two uh, AC injury. And like, it was the same thing. What I did, I, I started in a push up, push up position on my knees and mm-hmm. I just got better at falling onto my side because that was where I couldn't take that weight again. Right. Um, even though I did it in a tackle, uh, no, sorry. I got, when I got tackled, I got a shoulder on my shoulder. I didn't have the confidence to actually fall back on my shoulders. So all I did was start on my knees and just, fall onto my shoulder and feel okay this is good i can go again mm-hmm. and then um, and then yeah. how how do you structure and then we, so we talked about the mental aspect of recovering from an injury how do you structure and I, it, it obviously depends on what injury we're talking about there's there's many out there that unfortunately we can get but how do you structure the the return to play process um you know coming back from an injury getting stronger again hitting the gym what are for you kind of the how do you break it down uh in the strength and conditioning realm uh the main components that you want to uh, focus on as somebody's coming back from an injury? Um, well, I guess it depends. It, obviously, yeah, it really does depend on the injury. Mm. It depends. And then I'll, I'll, I'll tend to work with the physio. So they're, mm. they'll obviously go see a physio and then I'll be working with them, seeing what they think is going to help it, what's going to fix it fastest. And then I'll be then assessing them and assessing their range, where they feel pain, where they don't feel pain, where we can work. Mm. All right. And then I'm going to start working in a range where they don't feel pain around that area and start building up and down from that area. All right. And right. then start building that area where, where, wherever it may be. So say it's a knee um, and we need to come back from a knee injury. One of the most common things or a hamstring it's working with the physios. It's then looking at, okay, what movements can you do that we can build up around that area? Mm. All right. So, Calves, tibs, quads, hamstrings, glutes. Mm-hmm. Um, what can you do that we can start building this back up? And, and then already start building that confidence back up. So one of my first things like for a knee injury would be starting to walk backwards. Right? Most people after a knee injury can start walking backwards. They can start building up the quads, glutes um, straight away and mm-hmm. start giving that stability back. And then most people will be able to do calves nearly straight away. Mm-hmm. So once again, we're bringing that blood flow directly near that area. Yeah, so not, not holding back uh, more than necessary after the injury and really try to get active uh, you know, soon after, obviously, as, as long as, uh, as it doesn't produce excessive pain. And, and that, you know, like you said, checking with the physio that it's okay, but movement is key here. Yeah, definitely. Movement's key. Like if, if, if you're going to sit around, if you're going to sit around and not do anything, then it's going to atrophy. And we're not really helping it out. And, you know, blood is everything. Blood brings the nutrients. Blood brings life. So we need to get that blood back pumping around that, that area, especially if we want it to heal faster. Yeah. Um, 
so so definitely the movement aspect of uh recovery is is uh, is very important in my protocols maybe to backpedal a little bit but can you talk a little bit about how you transitioned to coaching from being a rugby player and why why did you make that transition and then how did it happen um so i was about 18 at the time and i just finished school and i knew i just i wanted to keep playing rugby i wanted to push that my brother was a personal trainer which Mm -hmm. made it a bit easier um i saw him training a lot of people um and so I, I thought, okay, why, why don't I try doing some coaching? You know, I'm always in the gym anyway. I started working out with him when I was about 15, mm-hmm. um, doing boot camps and all, all right. these other things. I was up at 5 a.m. Um, every morning doing doing these boot camps. Like I just, I loved being fit. I loved working out. Um, and then yeah, when I started hitting the gym, I I loved it. Like I I, I was obsessed. I, I and all I wanted to do was learn about it. You know, I would be reading for hours mm. on, on on different ways to work out what what it would do. So it just made sense to me that I would go and do that, and then I could help other people with it while I was playing rugby. It just seemed to go hand in hand. What uh, what, what are some of the things that that you that you thought you knew maybe about physical preparation in the realm of rugby early on when you were reading when you were young, you know, working out that you've kind of changed your mind about since then? Oh, definitely. This is probably the biggest one. I thought you just had to lift heavy. I just thought you had to lift heavy weights, bench press, squat, deadlift. I thought that was like more of a better powerlifting thing. And mm-hmm. I definitely thought the bigger bench press I had, the, uh, <laughs> the better I would play. But right. quite, yeah, not, not quite true. And that, so what's your, what's your take on, on that now? What, where do you stand in, uh, relative to you know, lifting heavy and, and kind of the big three, more the powerlifting side of things? Um, I got, I, I have no problem with them, but I mm. like to have range of strength. So if you're going to squat, I like people to just be able to sit on their heels. So like I need to be able to get all the way down. And if they can't because of their ankles, then I need to fix their ankles or I need to elevate. And if they're, they're, they literally can't because of their own uh, mechanics, then I need to elevate their heels a bit so they can. Mm-hmm. So the main thing... <sighs> There's a big thing I look at and the best ball runners of all time, if you look at them all, they all have giant quads and glutes, all right? And a lot of the movements that I see guys doing, they don't, they don't train, they don't target their quads well enough. So when they squat, they've got to squat all the way down. Mm-hmm. Um, number two is that, uh, but, sorry, I should say, they can't squat until they earn their squat though. So earning their squat would be, they, they would have to have the range um, or they would have to do, have done enough unilateral work to have earned that squat. Mm-hmm. All right. So during that unilateral work, they, if they should be able to acquire the range they need uh, to do a proper squat. Mm-hmm. And if they can't, that's when they'll elevate the heels. Um, so that's, that's a big one for me around, around the legs, hamstrings. Um, same sort of thing. Like, um, my hamstrings, I want, I want people to have very mobile hamstrings. So like one of my first tests is I want to see, I want to see how they can touch the ground. Can, can they get their palms to the ground? And mm-hmm. if they can't get their whole palms flat on the ground, then we need, we need to fix that. And we need to fix that through strength. They can't just be just doing stretching. Yes, we have stretches, but they need to be, uh, be able to hold that with weight. Mm-hmm. Right? All right. So when you get put in those awkward positions uh, in a rugby field, which is going to happen, happened to me the other day, uh, that you're strong there. Right. Um, so that, that was one of my biggest changes was uh, being stronger through a, a greater range of motion. Um, even chest stuff. So like my upper body stuff, my, my lifts for that would be more a dip. I love seeing a really uh, deep dip. And I love to see a, uh, a behind, head, uh, behind neck press compared to a bench. Bench press will always be good. If you have a great behind head uh, neck press and a great dip, then you're going to have some really strong shoulders and strong pecs. And, and like you said, you know, getting those ranges in the, in the dip, in the behind the neck press, you're getting into ranges that you might find yourself, you know, in the pitch if, if, if you're not quite on the tackle and, and the guy kind of flies by and your, your arm is a little bit behind you. At least you've, you know, you've worked those ranges and you're not, you know, kind of hoping for the best. 
Yeah, for sure. Like that's that's one of the biggest things that I find is is guys get hit and they've done a lot of pec work, but their pec work's only been to here, and then their pecs get torn back to here. You know, like <laughs> that extra bit of range is is uh, where people need to be strong, and and uh, that's where they they might get hurt. So that's that's why I find is is a big part of rugby training. Yeah. So since we're on the topic of strength training, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you differentiate between off season and then in season uh, weight training? It depends on the player. So um, it depends on the goal of the person too. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, uh, me personally, I do. I, I at this year, I just mainly focus on keeping myself on on the field because I just kept having these little niggles like my wrist, uh, my back. I just kept putting put in weird positions this year on the field. So for me, it was just my in-season has been literally make sure I feel good by Saturday. Mm. And it's just been a, a, a matter of just getting some blood flow and uh, some hypertrophy training to keep, to keep me feeling good right. um, and keep my size on during the season. For other players, um, like a young player uh, that – you know, might recover a bit faster. And if their goal is size, then we can definitely still put some size on and some muscle mass during the season. If, it, if their goal is power, then we can still keep them getting more powerful. And I can, I like to teach uh, the Olympic lifts, uh, especially uh, the power clean and power, hang power snatch is one I, I like to use a lot. Mm-hmm. And I like to be able to get those lifts up uh, during the season too. Mm-hmm. Are, you, are you able to, to get those... Uh, those lifts as well with players that you don't see in person that you, you know, coach from, uh, from afar. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing, one big thing I've been really working at is uh, getting guys to actually take. So when they sign up with me, I get them to video all their last sets and from a specific angle so I can see it all. And mm-hmm. then I can break it down by screenshot by screenshot exactly how I want them to do it. And yeah, by, by online, it's been actually been working pretty well. Um, surprisingly, I, I, I wasn't sure how it would first go when I first started doing online stuff, but yeah, yeah. it's actually working quite well. So can, maybe can you Which talk a little cool. bit, can you, yeah, like, can you talk a little bit about your process when it comes to coaching online? What are, what are the key things that you've put in place to make sure that you can follow up with your guys to make sure that they, you know, stick to the program, do the work, uh, you get the feedback that you need to coach them. So talk about this whole online coaching process that, like you said, is not always easy, but uh, when you figure out a good system, it, it works quite well. Yeah, definitely. So I use Train Heroic, which is uh, really simple to use. It shows me when all my athletes have logged a session. Um, it's very easy for me to put the videos in um, of each exercise, how I want it performed. I'm a bit of a uh, technique. Uh, <laughs> a bit, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit harsh on technique. I like I like to have really good technique, mm-hmm. and yeah, I, I really do believe that uh, sh- shit reps will make shit results, and good reps will make good results. So I'm, I'm very harsh on that. And I don't mind, especially with young guys, young guys, especially just, they just want to lift some tin. I get it. Like they just want to lift heavy and I can be a bit harsh on them sometimes, but they can really respect that too, that I come back and I, and, and I stick to my guns of, you know, what I want from them, what mm-hmm. I want to see. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the first thing I do with most people is I, I do a quick, I get them to send me some videos of uh, how they move. And the first program is always laying a base because I haven't met anyone yet who have, who's had a really strong solid base from ankles to knees, quads, hips. You know, they've, they've got these big weak links where we can get huge gains straight away. Mm-hmm. Um, your rotator cuffs, your scap work. I, I Straight away, if I can lay a better foundation on 99% of athletes, they will come back stronger and they'll feel better. All their other lifts will go up around it. So my first thing is laying that base, that foundation, and then I get to see those foundation movements that I put uh, that I put in. And after I've seen that, then I can sort of see where they're at, and I can I, and and I can judge from there. Okay, you will be you'll do better if you go to like a, a more power based program now, or this person will be better staying on a uh, more uh, more a base building program. Mm-hmm. And from there, they have to send me their, via their videos of their last set. And that's, that, that's what's important is me actually seeing them move and then critiquing them 
and letting them know. And then they had that feedback and they had the feedback of looking themselves. So then they're knowing what they're looking at. Um, I think that's really important. And me explaining, you know, what I want from each exercise and then having a target for each exercise. Mm -hmm. So when we have these targets, then we can start, you know, working towards something. And I find that really important uh, for, for players, for, for anyone, you know, when you have that target and to, to push towards. And then I have a bit of a community going uh, where I, I want everyone sort of pushing each other to go mm-hmm. after these targets. You know, I want that bit of a competition. Uh, can you talk a little bit about something you, you mentioned that, that popped out for me is you want them to know what to look for when they're doing their lifts and maybe even looking at their own videos. So building in almost uh, a little bit of uh, autonomy from your athletes. So how, how do you, can you, we push that a little bit farther? How do you uh, try to bring that to your players so that, you know, they're maybe not fully self-sufficient, but at least they have a certain level of uh, you know, they, they know what to look for. They know how to think. They know how to adjust maybe from one day to the next if they're not feeling great. All those little details that we don't think about, you know, because you, you just think, oh, I just need a program. But the, the program is the easy part. Applying mm-hmm. the program to everyday life is actually the hard part. So how do you convey that to your athletes? Yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing, isn't it? Like, we're not robots. And uh, a lot of people think that, like, there's this one secret program that's, that's going to get them everything. when Really, we're not. It's not. You know, we're all individuals. We're all going to recover at slightly different rates. We all have different mechanics too on how we work. Mm-hmm. So, my biggest thing is trying. You know, uh, the quote is, uh, "You can, you can only lead a horse to water, right?" But I want to make right. that, that that horse thirsty. <laughs> right? I want I want them to want to know. You know, how can they how can they improve themselves? How can they become better? So, I guess it starts in the beginning when they first do sign up. Um, with me is, is a big goal setting thing. All right. So I, I get them straight away to write down all their goals. You know, what are they, who, who do they want to become? Who do they want to be in one year's time? All right. And once we have that picture, who do you want to be in one year's time? We can break it down. You know, we can break down the goals and we do three month blocks of goals. And then we break it down to each month, each week. What, it, what are you going to do? Who, who, what do you, what do you need to do? to become the person you want to become, right? And I help them mm-hmm. break that down. And then from there, it's okay. If your goal is all the way up here, then you're going to do, have to do a lot more than just this to get there, you know? Or I can say, oh, well, maybe why don't we try and push this goal a bit higher? So this is where I'm trying to make them a bit more thirsty uh, for their own knowledge and, you know, wanting to push themselves and showing them, okay, if you want this, you're going to have to work a bit harder for it. And then that will come into with the targets of, the exercises, okay, this is where we want to be try, try and be if you want to be, you know, a pro. Mm-hmm. And then why do you want that exercise? You know, why do you need a really strong Nordic for your hamstrings? Why do you need to do your sprint training so you don't tear a hamstring? Mm-hmm. Why, you know, why do I need to look at your, your sprint technique so you gain the most, out of, uh, most efficiency out of your sprint? And if I can get these whys through and they start to understand it, then they can put more quality into each, each rep they do. They can put more quality into every set they do. Because if they, they, they can start understanding it and say, okay, oh, well, I want to get to over here. You know, I, I want to be, I mean, I want to be a super rugby player. I want to be a professional rugby player. Then I can't do the crap reps. I've got to do the good quality reps. I've got to get to myself to this level. Um, I've got to be on top of my recovery. If I'm not feeling well, then you know i then now i can go and do my forearm session right mm-hmm. that's my that's an option for them if they're not feeling well they've got a forearm session real right. real simple um so yeah this is this is what i was coming back to was i want to i want to make them thirsty for their own knowledge and i and i have all that that my knowledge sort of there on a website plus they can contact me anytime too so right um that 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 is a big part of it for me is uh getting them to start to understand themselves understand the training more and what they're trying to achieve you know starting to create their own lives here 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I think that's a super important part. So you touched on a few different things since we started here. So the strength training, you talked about sprinting. So how do you conceptualize or how do you kind of cut into different parts, the physical preparation for rugby? How do you organize an athlete's week around those different components? Uh, so what are, what are the key factors here for you in terms of physical preparation? Um, it, it comes back to their goal. So Mm -hmm. um that their, their, their preparation will definitely come down to their goal specifically so i like to look at you know what is going to make this this guy a better rugby player to start off with you know if he's 70 kilos then he, he's he's only going to really play a lot better if he's you know another 10 15 kilos heavier mm -hmm. so and, and that would be that will be our main focus where you know we're going to get you heavier we're going to get you stronger um and, and that way they're going to play better rugby. If it is, if they're, if they're going to be a mixture of things, so say they just need to put uh, strength on um, with speed, then I will break it down into, depending where we are in the season, I would be looking at, if it was off season, I'll be looking at trying to get more weights in with a little bit of uh, sprint work. Mm -hmm. And then that would sort of switch over as we get closer to the season. i will get a bit more sprint work, a bit more agility, a bit more skill work in towards uh that 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 near the near the season mm -hmm. it, what what do you see as the biggest thing that's missing from uh you know amateur rugby players uh programs when they when they get started with you what have they tried in the past that just wasn't sufficient and what do you try to you know kind of add on to this uh, what's the biggest missing link in your mind um Good question. I would say, for me, amateur rugby players, just, most of them aren't strong enough, just in general. Most of them mm. don't care enough to go to that next level. Um, if, if they were in between, then, and, and, you know, they really wanted to get stronger. One of the biggest problems I actually, that, come to, that people come to me with is shin splints. Oh, okay. And so, like, that's such a simple fix. Like it really is a simple fix of working the TBRs anterior properly and getting enough calf work in and then looking at how they're landing and fixing their running technique a little bit. And usually that's fixed within a month. Mm -hmm. So mammoth rugby players who get a lot out of just fixing their own techniques. So, so if, they, if they wanted to be fitter, looking at how they're breathing, how they're moving um, and making sure they're getting strong enough. Uh, but, but just in general, most amateur rugby players are just not doing enough strength training. They're just too weak. And then how do you, uh, how do you balance that out with, you know, uh, busy personal schedules? If somebody maybe has a, has a family already, uh, how do you usually, you know, uh, play, play that card? Cause we, we all know that recovery is, is such a big piece when it comes to, you know, you got to do more work Well, you got to recover more as well. Uh, but then if you're lacking sleep for, you know, work reasons professional reasons personal reasons uh i see you have the doggy there in the in the room yeah I just, she just came in my sister's husky just came in <laughs> she, she was just supposed to be part of the show man <laughs> yeah she, she just let herself in the door the door was closed <laughs> let herself in the door <laughs> nice well, well we'll we'll do we'll do it we'll do it with her that's that's yeah, totally fine she, so, so she is now she is now in it she's of now course. part of the podcast exactly what's yeah, her yeah. name what's her name so she, we can uh, introduce that's... you properly <laughs> yeah, yeah leah come here leah she's gonna get up yeah, Leah. No, nah, she's not gonna get up. She's gonna right. lay down. I actually have my dog next to me too. So <laughs> she came in to join us. My dog's super quiet. And that's Nala. Um, yeah. Yeah. So talk about that the recovery aspect and how you might help someone manage a busy personal and professional schedule around uh, you know training for rugby. Yeah, of course. So a, a lot of my clients are in that in that boat. They're in that mm -hmm. boat where they're they're working a full time job plus they're training for rugby. Um, plus, you know, trying to get to the gym. So it's, it, it can be, you know, really full on. Um, so, so first of all, the number one uh, rule for me is sleep. And let's see how we can get you the best quality sleep possible. Mm -hmm. So sleep hygiene is always going to be number one, making sure their room's dark, um, you know, making sure that, that everything around their sleep time is, becomes a schedule, doing all sorts of little things like journaling, um, some meditation techniques I, I put in there for them. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of things I do around sleep, but sleep is number one. How many hours and what kind of quality 
I do ask um, my guys if they, you know, if they really want to take it further is to get a aura ring because I use an aura ring or a, a whoop band mm -hmm. and let's actually have a look at how well you're recovering and tracking their HRV. Mm -hmm. um, I can get a better, better understanding around that. Do you, do you actually, then, do you actually, sorry to cut you off. Get, did you, do you actually get them to, for those who do track HRV, do you get them to auto-regulate the training in some way, uh, given their, their scores, or is it just something that you use for kind of information purposes to, so that the athlete knows on that day, uh, how they might feel when they go into training? Um, I just give them a bit of free reign there. So mm. I, I would like them to have a look at their HRV and not be like, Oh, okay. I really need to change my, tra my training program. Mm -hmm. Um, too much today my thing is if they're really flat then keep uh the intensity and drop the sets mm -hmm. and just re really reduce volume so that's usually my go-to if they're re and if they're extra flat then go to a uh, a uh, forearm session or a uh a grip strength session mm -hmm. but my, my main thing is just become aware of how they're actually recovering and I think that makes a uh, really big difference is just that, that level of awareness. Oh, okay. I need to sleep a bit better. Uh, if, if I'm going to get my best quality recovery and, and just having that, that little tracking just gives you a little bit of a reminder. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm not quite on track at the moment. Maybe I've been going out too much or whatever it may be, you know, mm -hmm. maybe I do need to pull back a little bit. And then if they, if they do, if they need to pull back, then they can let me know and I can show them how to do it or I can do it for them. What, what currently fascinates you in the, in the rugby performance world? Um, what really fascinates me? That's a good question. Um, what really fascinates me? I, you know, I'm, I, what really fascinates me is those guys that, well, Leah, what's going on? She wants to talk she's to never you. Liked, she's usually really quiet. She's usually really quiet husky. And she can tell we're having a great time and she wants to be a yeah, part Yeah, now she wants to come have a chat. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'm really, what I really love is uh, seeing guys that can, uh, that just have this knack for busting tackles. Right. Um, I, have this, I have a thing for uh, farmer kids, like kids that grow up in farms. I think they have a lot of uh, strength that, is untapped when if you're a city boy and you go you just go to the gym mm -hmm. right it's not the same yeah and it's something like that i want to try and develop with my players so i do a lot of sled pulls a lot of farmer carries and i add them together i do a sled pull farmer carry uh thing together yeah and i do it for uh i try and keep it low intensity and i try and keep it uh for, for quite a bit of volume mm -hmm. and I, what i'm trying to do is just uh is give off what the farm what a farmer strength sort of uh, kid would would have. Yeah. Um. So that's what really uh, so something really fascinates me because those guys just seem to be able to bust tackles uh, much easier and hold their feet much easier than a lot of other guys can. Um. Yeah. You know, I have no. I have nothing to prove that, but it's just something that I've observed over, yeah, over the years. It's it's really funny you say that because there is that you know that theme coming back and we see that in rugby you see that in wrestling and other sports as well where those kids come come from a a very physical upbringing and and background and they do have that you know my mind goes to strongman but it's it's not yeah. even really you know it's not necessarily that per se uh, and and obviously you know some kind of strongman training can can be beneficial in the realm of rugby, but it, it, it is not what necessarily the, the differentiating factor, but mm -hmm. like you say, it's, it's really interesting to see those kids come up and they, they just have that ability to, I don't know if it's create tension upon impact and, and really, you know, get really stiff really quickly so that, you know, they, they don't, you know, kind of flop to the ground like a spaghetti. Uh, yeah. and, and they're, they're able to, you know, like you said, stand their feet, keep moving, uh, is that something that you're able to, to kind of train a little bit in your opinion, or does that really come from your background in general? No, definitely. I think, I, I think if you look at like what they were doing on farm work, especially here in Australia, you're either, you know, with sheep or you're moving hay bales as my dad used to like to say. Um, but what I like to, yeah, well, so that there'll be parts of my programming where it'll be very low uh, intensity, high volume of sled pull farmer carries where I actually join them together and they've got to walk a sled while carrying a farmer carry mm -hmm. for, you know, 
uh, 60 to 100 meters. Right. And you do that a couple of times. And yeah, it's not heaps heavy, but after you do it, I don't know if you have a fair few times, you know, your body is actually getting pulled apart. Right. And, you know, one of, one of my best athletes, he is, uh, well, he's about 82 kilos. So he's not a big guy. He's a halfback. And he is, he's what, top, top of the try? Oh, no, sorry. He's second in line in, in try scorers this year in their mm. shoot shield. So just under professional. So hopefully right. get, a, get him a professional contract next year. Nice. Um, but his ability to beat tackles and just, just get hit and keep moving since we've done a lot of this work is just insane. Like he's just amazing at it. Um, I, I keep putting uh, films up on my Instagram page of him, of him just <laughs> absolutely dominating tackles. Yeah. So, what do you think is the biggest, if somebody wants to, you know, learn how to do that better, uh, where, where do you start when it comes to, to that? Is it, is it a certain attitude that you bring into contact? Uh, how, how do you try and, and, and you know, make, make that kind of impact and you know, not go down on the first one, maybe not even on the second tackle, mm. and you know, just get, keep gaining some meters? Yeah, I, th I think that's all in your head. I, I honestly think that's in your head and then practicing that, like out on the pitch, out, out training with friends, like just that ability to not want to go down. I think a lot of guys, especially amateurs, just get hit and just allow it to go, go with, go, you know, to go, let themselves go down. Mm -hmm. But when you change your mind to be like, okay, no, I'm going to hold my feet here. I'm going to pump my legs. You know, I'm not going to get tackled here. Something else happens and you're, you're able to keep on moving. Um, I find that, that that's massive for myself too. Like when I'm playing a game and I want to make a tackle bus and I think in my head, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bust the line here. I usually either make meters or I bust the line. Um, it's only been one game this year I haven't had a line break, which is, uh, you know, that, I, I, that was on the weekend actually. I didn't get a line break. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what did I do wrong here? <laughs> right. So, so like you said, really that mindset of how do you – get into the contact what are you thinking about when you get there and not essentially just give in to that first impact and say oh he touched me so now i've got to go down that's yeah and and i, and I train a lot of kids like 14 15 and they're so used to being told to go down you yeah. know they'll be at a uh, training and they'll, they'll hit the pads and they go down 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 so they go down and i think they get into that, that mindset a little bit too much yeah um rather than being like okay i'm gonna beat this guy you know, I, th that's why I sort of, sort of talked about that competitiveness before is I want my guys or anyone that wants to play rugby to be, be competitive at every little moment. You know, every time you carry the ball is an opportunity to, to be competitive and want to beat that person. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, I, I, I love that. I love that bit, a part about it is it's, yes, it's a whole team effort, but in, in that you have individual things as well where you get the opportunity to try and beat someone. It's the same as for me for tackling. It's like tackling for me is such a mindset thing. Yes, you need technique and you need to learn where to put your legs, but if you want to make a tackle and you want to put someone on their ass or you want to chop them, then it's in your head. It really is so much just in your head being like, yep, I'm going to do it, and you just, you just go out and do it. Yeah. Patrick, it's been a great pleasure talking with you today. I've got a couple short questions to, to finish off here. What would be one piece of advice for amateur players who want to take their game to the next level? I would say go and get yourself a coach. Um, you, you, honestly, I have a coach for everything in my life, for business, for my own coaching, for my own strength conditioning. I've had coaches. If you want to progress faster and actually be guided, go and get yourself a proper coach. Like I'm not saying for this, for, you need to go see me. You can go and see any coach that has coached people before for what you want to do, and make sure they're doing something that for what you want to do. You know, mm -hmm. if you if you say if you want a business coach, go and make sure that business coach has made millions of dollars if that's what you want to do with business. <laughs> <laughs> Same as rugby. If you want to go and play rugby, then go and get yourself a rugby coach who knows how to get you uh, get you to that level. Do you, do you usually recommend any books for, for people to read? Is that, is that something that you try to, yeah. to bring to your athletes? Yeah, definitely. And it, it depends where they're at in their, their life. Um, I, I do a lot of stoic books. So uh, The Obstacle is Away is probably one of my favorite by uh, Ryan mm -hmm. Holiday. Yeah. Um, I, and most books by Ryan Holiday I recommend. Um, and that's just coming back to that mindset, that stoic philosophy that um, you know, we're greater than we think we are. And it's, you know, a lot of it's in our head. Um, so, 
a lot of a lot of stoic books I like to recommend to my clients is uh, just about the mindset. Yeah, that's that's perfect. I was going to ask you for a non-training book, so so that fits the bill right there. Last question for you, Patrick. Uh, what if you could change one thing about the rugby strength and conditioning world right now? What would it What would it be? Um, I would say people are way too soft, and they need to harden up and actually do some hard work, and then go and recover. Uh, <laughs> Stop going out and drinking so much and ruining your recovery. There's two things. <laughs> no, I, I like it. I, that, that makes a lot of sense. Patrick, it's been a pleasure talking with you today. So for all the, the listeners that are interested in learning more about what you do and what you offer as a service for rugby athletes, where can they find you on, on social? Uh, on social media, you got Rugby Development Coach on Instagram and on Facebook. And then my, rug, uh, my website is therugbydc.com. Fantastic, man. I'll link those in the comments for all the people watching and listening. It's been a pleasure having you today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care, Patrick. All right. See you later. 